We know this week's parasha, parashat Korach. Now, who, who is Korach and what happened in the story of Korach? Now, everyone, I'm pretty sure, is familiar with a little bit of details, but we're going to go into a little bit more depth. But last week, we spoke about how she Akina, Ataavot, Ve'akavot, these three things, the jealousy, the desires, and the uh, honor, take a person out of this world. Right? And it's a continuing thing, right? We spoke about in the past how Avera, uh, Goret Avera, a sin brings about another sin. So we see it started with uh, people complaining about the man. Oh, we want the food, so on and so forth. Then it went to Miriam. And then from Miriam, it went to the Meraglim, it went to the spies. And then from the spies, we get over here to Korach and the Toh. The Korach and the 250 people went, uh, went with. But obviously, you have to understand the big principle that we spoke about it in the past. That to stop ourselves from getting to these places, we have to realize that in life, Things work, and I didn't really write this down, but I'm going to come on for a little side tangent and we'll build into the class. Things work in, in life, domino effect. When you do an action, you cause another action to come about. A lot of times you have people come to you and say to you, Rabbi, I don't understand, how is it possible that this thing befell on me? Like, for example, they have some hardship or something like that. And they don't understand that an action that they did 10 years earlier set this in motion. Because at the end of the day, Akrosh Bachu, He forgives everything. And if you do tshuva shlema, to do a real tshuva, the Rambam writes, what's a real tshuva? One of the key elements of real repentance is, is harata. It's to regret it. But many people have a difficulty with that portion of it. When you tell them, this is the steps, this is what you should do. You should, as ahead, you should leave it alone. You should make kabbalah lati, take upon yourself and never do it again. Then you do harata, or if you do it, you do confession. And harata, which is, I regret, I'll never do it. I'll not, I regret that I actually did it. But a lot of times what you see is a person who regrets something he did in the past, and then later on, six months later, you see him hanging out with his friends, and all of a sudden he's bragging about it. As if it, a person truly regrets something, and never wants to talk about it ever again. So what does it mean to truly regret something? So you have to really understand that when we say regret, we don't actually, we mean, imagine now, just to paint an image, if something embarrassing happened to you, if you were in public and something embarrassing happened, you tripped, you fell, you would never want to talk about it again, because it's something that's embarrassing. I can't believe I did that. I can't believe I fell. I can't believe everyone saw me. You wouldn't want to talk about it, right? If you truly felt regret over the action that you did, you wouldn't want to talk about it either. So now that you come later on and say, oh, you know, I was like this. No, I was like that. Then what are you showing? You're really showing that you, some part of you doesn't truly regret that aspect of it. And what ends up happening is, is for Hashem to really clean you completely from that, which without any domino effect, for Hashem to really go out of its way to clean it completely, that's to be the full regret. And if you don't have the full regret, then unfortunately, so the Gemara brings down in a few different places, that one of the ways that a person is menake isurim, I mean, is avonot, is sins, is isurim, set up as isurim, set up as suffering. And he brings it upon himself, and he doesn't realize that it's a domino effect of something he did in the past. It's the funniest thing, I always see people, they get into religion, and then something bad befalls them, something a hardship befalls them, and right away, the first sign of hardship, like, oh, I don't understand it, how could it be, I'm running away. So how does it work? Meaning, most people don't understand. You know, there's a pasuk in the Torah that says, Hashem pays the people he hates in their face. Meshadem is another panav. Rashi writes, what does it mean he pays the people he hates in their face? He pays people who he doesn't like them in this world. What does it mean in this world? He gives them all the reward here. And that way, in the next world, Rashi explains that when they get up over there, they say, wait a minute, I had some good things I did. I was a nice guy. I helped my grandma. I helped this, I helped that. Hashem said to me, look, you're right. You were a good guy and you did a few good things. But overall, you weren't a good person. Overall, you were a terrible person. So I paid you in this world. You didn't have the Lamborghini. You didn't have the yacht. You didn't have the jet. You had all these things over here. So I paid you over here. Sometimes, and I've seen this personally with a few people, they were very, very wealthy, but they lived the life of Rashaim. What's the name of Rashaim? Wicked people. What do I mean wicked people? Doing Isurim that are... Chachamim Magdir Otam is Yerek Vali Avol. Do things that, that you should never do. You should, it'd be better off that you die than to do them. And then they come back, and they lose some of their business dealings, some of their money, and they ask, how is it possible? And I, I, I had to stand testament to this one person in my life that I saw, and I, was, and I was lucky enough to bear witness to it, that they were extremely wealthy. They had maybe $50, $60 million, something like that. Not a billionaire, but $50, $60 million is a lot of money. <laughs> if I came to you now with a check of $50, $60 million, everybody over here would be happy. We'd go home and that's it. It's called Tavia Fe. And uh, when she decided to come back to religion, she lost it all. Damn it, fair. Now, many people in the situation, what would they have said? How could Hashem do this to me? This is what I get. This is my reward. Zutura. This is the reward I get for Torah. I come back to Hashem. This is what He gives me. 
But instead she said to herself, she's like, I can't explain the feeling, but I feel like Hashem cleaned me. I feel like the, all the things I did in my past that I felt regret for them, truly regret for them, and I, now I feel like they're completely gone for me. I feel like they, I don't have to worry about them anymore. I don't have to think about them anymore. They're gone. It's an internal feeling of peace that no, nothing else in the world can replace. No matter how much money you would give me, you could never replace this feeling of peace, of relief that I have inside. You know, one of the things that eat people inside the most is the guilt. When they feel guilty. But how do you get rid of that guilt? Imagine being able to take something that you feel guilty for, which is, could be something very bad. Could be a woman with a home record. Could be a, a man slept with a married woman. And he broke up a marriage with a family, with kids, a wife. God forbid. How do you get to these places? But if that, God forbid, it happened. Imagine the level of guilt a person feels. Can you ever be clean such a thing? Can you ever be clean such a thing? Imagine I tell you there's a way for that to happen. The Gemara says there's a few people that are considered to be like that. And one of them is a the person who loses his money. A person who is wealthy and loses his money, who I consider to be as if, as, as if he's died, if he's died, quote unquote. What does that mean? That means if he was chayav a punishment, if he was chayav something, and this came upon him, Hashem just gave you this, this instead of this. And it's funny, I just saw today, I wasn't going to talk about it, I didn't write this down, so just bear with me. Rabbein Ubache, he writes, in the Gebe Koach also, really it's in Bamidba, we're going to talk about it a little bit more in depth, but he talks about how if you look, there's a constant cycle of 40. What do I mean? The Maraglim, the spies, when they went into Israel, how many days were there? Were they there? 40 days. How many days was the punishment? 40 years. When a person, says, when a person does something that he has to get lashes, how many lashes? 40, but really 39. Right? So what's this cycle of 40? So we know the baby, when it comes, is fully formed the day of 40. Up until the 40th day, it's considered to be, Gemara calls it Maya Be'alma. It's considered to be like just uh, a, a liquid, but on the 40th day, it becomes fully formed. That's when it gets its soul. That's when it gets Hashem already. The Gemara Sechini says that already Hashem de- predetermined who it's going to marry, what kind of life it's going to live. The one thing it doesn't des- destined for him is whether he's going to be a righteous person or a wicked person. But everything else is already decreed for him. 40 day. So we see that the way that Hashem operates the world is. In a way where things work in a beautiful harmony. Where things are just an extension of something you did. Why was the punishment 40 years? You know Hashem, He works measure for measure. How can He punish the spies for 40 days, 40 years? Shana, Leyom. For every day they were there, He gave them a year. Why? What was the, what was the thing? Rashi writes that the, the Meraglim, the spies, should have took Musa, should have took, uh, what's it called? The, how do you say Musa in English? Rebuke or a criticism. Not criticism, introspection or a, some type of learn. They should have learned from Miriam. They should have learned from Miriam. That Miriam, who spoke about her brother with good intentions, who wanted to do something good, Hashem punished her. How much more so you? You want to go into Israel? The only reason you did it was because you wanted to bring yourself up. The Zohar says, why did they do it? Because they had kavod. Because they wanted to, oh, we're men of stature, we have a vajah, we have a tradition. How did you get to this place? You should have taken Musa. And I think the punishment is befitting. Midaki Negi Midah. Why? Because it, was, it took them maybe one hour to give a bad account on what they saw, right? They came back and said, what we saw over there was this. We saw giants, this, that, so on and so forth. The land that eats its inhabitants. They're complaining. It took them about an hour and Hashem punished them for 40 years. What's the connection between the two? So really the 40 days is the punishment. Why is the 40 days the punishment? What did they do for 40 days? That every single day that they were there, they had a bad eye. Every single day they were there, they said, we're going to come back with something bad. We're looking for bad. We're looking for bad. And it wasn't that they gave a bad account. It was the midah. It was the character trait that they had inside of them. The midah mushretet. The bad character trait that caused them to fall. That was the sin. It wasn't that you, the action. You know when you go to the dentist, oh, it's a KV, never KV. Oh, you come complaining, you're swollen like a tomato. And the, and the guy tells you, you know what, go home, take uh, 400 milligrams of ibuprofen, you'll be okay. You go home, take 400 milligrams of ibuprofen. For about four hours, you feel, oh, I feel like a new man. All of a sudden, the fourth hour, yo, you came back. You come back to the dentist, tell him, hello. What are you telling me to take ibuprofen for? It's just numbing the pain. What's the issue? Oh, he comes and says, oh, wait, now that I'm looking at it, you have a cavity. Oh, you, have a, you need a root canal. Oh, now you tell me, send me home first. So obviously in life, a person needs to understand that there's something called the side effect and there's the root cause. 
There's a side effect of something and there's the root cause of something. The spies, they didn't just come and give a bad account because that was just a side effect. What was the real problem? That from the beginning, they already came with the bad eye. From the beginning, they already wanted to say, I'm going to give something bad. And I think that's something that everyone in the world needs to work on. How do you know? You want to sign for yourself. I don't think anybody here. But you want to sign for yourself? When you see another person succeeding, is the first thing you do, you say, wow, congratulations. Or is the first thing you do is give a, no, nah, but he's really not. No, no. It's, <laughs> it's all show. It's all show. It's all fake. He doesn't really have any money. Oh, no, she's actually, whatever you see with her, she's all phony baloney. Why is the first thing that we want to do is always see the gnaw in other people, the bad in other people? Not all social shalom. Everybody here tzadikir, everybody here tzadikot, everybody here is righteous, no one here. But the people in the world, they still, another, they still have the city, what the first thing is, oh, no, he's really. Why do we go there right away? Why do we go there right away? And if a person would send these men, set these mental triggers in their mind to understand what's a signal that I have something bad inside of me, they would realize, wait a minute, I do that. I do, I hear someone's doing good, I, right away I give another excuse of why he's not doing so good. Why do I do that? Oh, maybe I also have a little bit of jealousy inside of me. Or maybe I also have, so now let me uproot that. But why does a person not get there? Because he's not aware of himself. He doesn't do the introspection. And that's why Rashi says they should have taken Musa. What's a Musa? Introspection. Why Introspection. Because when you learn a Sefer Musa, when you go and you open up, you open up a Sefer Musa, Path of the Just, Way of the Upright, whatever, whatever book you want. You open up and you read it, it's not just to be supposed to be words. In fact, the Ramchal, in Mesat Sharim, in the beginning, he says, I didn't come and tell you anything new. Nothing you learn in this book is going to be new. Nothing. Everything you already know. But the real way to learn this book is to continuously learn it, so that way you remind yourself of the things that are the most known to you. <laughs> it's obvious. Be a good person. Everybody knows how to be a good person. Yes, how come you're not doing it? All right, Robert Victor Miller, I said this in the class before, but I think you guys remember to try this exercise. And I always mention it. And I think it hits people really hard because Robert Victor Miller brings an example. He says, most people will go down the same flight of stairs their whole entire life from their house and they don't know how many steps they have from the, from the, floor to, from the house to the floor. They don't know. And I said it six months ago and I guarantee people heard it, they still don't know how many. Some people came to me after one time. One time I gave a shiur. One time I gave a class and I said to everyone in the room, like, wow, you know, I never really thought about it. 20 years living in the same house, I don't know. Five, six, I don't know. One guy in the back was like, 17. <laughs> <laughs> I told him, you know, there's always there's one person who me in the class. <laughs> one person who always comes out of the day. What? Good for you. <laughs> you know, good for you. But then you would see the guy, you think to yourself, oh, this guy probably works on himself. But it's not, not true. 17 stairs, he knows. But the fact that he has midot mishkotot, that he has back hair, he doesn't want to work on it. So what did you do? You took the whole cloud and you ruined it. A person needs to be aware. And I think, even though I didn't come to talk about this, it's always a side note. I think that this is why Korach fell. You know, the Midrash brings down, by Midrash Rabbah, a couple of different places brings down that Korach was actually a huge chacham, a huge person in Torah. He knew Torah left and right. Not only that, the, the Gemara brings it down, he was extremely wealthy. We'll go through this. How do you get such a person and get him to fall? How do you get such a person? Not only that, 250 people were with him. And don't tell me he went and he got a couple of, uh, I don't know, janitors to come with him. 250 heads. Heads. Every single one of them was a, uh, was uh, one of the top ranking men of stature. Their names were well renowned, the Midrash says. They were well known. 200 people. How do you get them to come with you? How do you get them to come with How? Korach, to be Chacham. You know who Korach was? He was the first cousin of Moshe Rabbeinu. First cousin. You know, that means his father and Moshe's father, Amram, who was, by the way, the leader before Moshe, was Amram. Was his father. Who was his brother? Korach's father. Yitzhak. So that's your father. That's your uncle. This is your, your cousin. Who's your first cousin? Moshe Rabbeinu and Aaron and Miriam. Those are your first cousins. And you come from a prestigious family, the family of the Ka'ati, the Ka'at family, the, oh, the prestigious Levi, the Levi family, that's Moshe Rabbeinu comes from them, Uziel, uh, Elitzefan ben Uziel comes from them, who's going to be the leader of them. So many prestigious people come from this family, how do you get a person to fall? And not only that, 250 people, hey, how did they get to fall? I'm going to talk about it a little more, and it's another side thing, but I think, I think that the answer is very clear. That when a person has the lack of awareness, when a person doesn't allow himself to be real with himself, 
to say, wait a minute, what am I doing right now? What's going to be the outcome of this action right now? Right? We spoke about last week. Miyacham, Ezra Acham, a Gemara Tamid, who is a wise person, a person who sees the outcome of his actions. Huh? Yeah, that's Gemara Tamid. So the person who sees the outcome of his actions. He's a person who's wise. And you have to ask yourself a question. Okay, what's going to be now? What's going on? Why am I doing this? Why do I really want this? You know, the Gemara Sechat Sanhedrin says that, you know why Korah fell? Because his wife egged him on. He came home, and his wife's like, he came home, you have to remember, like, that's what Parashah, they had the lifting, a few weeks ago, they learned about the lifting service. That all the Levim came, and there was a lifting service. They were literally lifted up in the air, and they had to shave their old heads. So Korah comes home, and you can imagine now, Korah is a man of stature. He comes home to his wife, and his wife tells him, I don't recognize you, who is this? Who, who? What is it? You have no hair, no eyebrow hair, no nothing. He comes over there like a naked mole rat. And she writes a first response. Ooh, uh, what are you doing here? Get away from her. Who are you? And he's already like, what do you mean? It's me. It's me. So what's the big deal? Put a hand. So for a few weeks, I went hand until it goes back out. What are you making a big deal over here? Oh, what happened? This, that, shot egging him on. And because of that, he fell. But Korak knew how powerful words were. Korak didn't know. Korach didn't know how powerful world. What's the job of the Levim in the, in the Beit Hamikdash? What's the power? Of the, what's the job of the Levim in the Holy Temple? A few jobs, but one of them was to sing. One of them was to sing. Why? Because song has a way to enter the heart, right? We spoke about. I don't know if it was over here. I think I said it over here. But there's certain people. They, you know, they 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 they, they live their life in a fantasy. They be in the car, and they put on over there. You put them a sad song. He starts going to the window. He's, Already crying, he's already in the third movie, it's raining, you know? Why is, it, why is that? Where did it come from? You're just driving to Manhattan. <laughs> what happened over here? How'd you get over here? Because this song has a way to penetrate your heart. And more than that, a song is extremely memorable. What do I mean to say? A song, you can listen to a song that you knew, I don't know, 15 years ago. I can start the first word of the song, guarantee you still remember the lyrics. Yeah, I'm not going to try it now. I don't want to embarrass myself over here. But <laughs> guarantee you pull out a song from 15 years ago, whatever it may be, everyone in the room starts singing it. Why? You may have not heard it for five, seven, eight years. How do you still remember? Because song is a special way to penetrate the heart. So you see that what you hear can have a very, very big impact on you. Right? And Koch was the Levi. Who knew that more than the Levi? And he didn't think this up for a moment. Wait a minute. My wife is coming and telling me these things now. Should I not listen? And the flip side of the coin. And the flip side of the coin. The Gavon Sechat Anedrin brings down another person. Another person was a part of them. Who was on? On Ben Pelet. What happened with him? He was supposed to go with them. He tells his wife, I'm going to go and join them up against Moshe Rabbeinu. She doesn't want you crazy. She goes, how are you going to go against Moshe Rabbeinu? Moshe Rabbeinu is? You don't see that every time someone goes against you, they lose. Do yourself a favor, stay home. No, but they're coming. I'm ready. They already came to my house. Eight o'clock. They're supposed to be here. She tells him, "Don't worry, I'll take care of it." She gives him a little bit of wine. He falls asleep. She takes off. That time, wood is very common. Women only wear head coverings. She took off her head covering to show you who the people were. The Roman Sechet Andrew says this. They just saw her from the window with a head covering on. All 250 of them ran away. What kind of man is this? His wife is walking around with that, and they ran away. These are the same guys. They don't want to see a married woman with her hair uncovered. But to go up against Moshe, no, no problem. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah, yeah. What happened? How do you get yourself to fall so hard? So let's let's really dissect this a little bit further. Let's understand what was Koch so upset about, right? What was Koch's whole claim? Let's try and get into the foot. One of the things we talk about in the class. What's the what's the what's the beauty of the Gemara? It tells you step out of yourself and try and see things in another perspective. You know, the Gemara you could spend about a day, three days. Learning it one way, for the God to say, no, take this to throw it to the garbage now. This is not the right answer. Here's another answer. What? I just understood. I just broke my hand on this for three days to understand this one way. Now you're giving me a whole different way. Why? Because that is actually one of the most beneficial, beneficial things of the Gemara. Is it shows you how to step outside of yourself and see things in your life in another person's perspective. Okay, wait a minute. I understood it this way. Let me try and step out of the way I understood it and put myself into this person's shoes. How did they understand it? And by the way... I spoke about this in the past, but this is actually the secret to have happy relationships in your life. You want to have a happy relationship with your mother, your father, your sister, your aunt, your uncle, your wife, your husband, whoever it is in the entire world, try and understand where they're coming from. I guarantee you, nine out of ten fights will be resolved the first time you say to yourself, you know what, let me take a step back 
and see what they're talking. Let me see why, why. Why would they have the reason to be upset over here? You know how many times I say myself a fight with my wife, just for saying to her, you know what? It's okay. You're upset. You have a reason for being upset. If you if, if you feel this way, there must be a reason that made you. I, I don't. I don't see it. I don't agree. Okay, but I don't, I don't say that. I'm telling you now. Yeah. Okay. I don't see it. I don't agree. But I don't want to tell her. I tell her, look, if you feel this way, it must be I did something to make you feel this way. And therefore, tell me what I need to do to work on it. Ah, huh? instead of, no, what are you talking about? Blah, 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 fighting for three weeks. Then I go to work. I'm not working. Well, go to Kodel, really. <laughs> More accurate. Go to Kodel. I'm barely learning because. And the guy's going to work. He's sitting over there. He can't even pick up the phone. Now he thinks his wife's going to be home upset with him and he's going to make money in the business. Yeah? I had one case like that. I was, you know, I, 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 I was okay to help a few marriages. And I, I, one time I had the wife call me, of course, to my wife, so on and so forth, huh? Yeah? She called my wife, she tells my wife, look, we got into a fight. This morning he leaves the house to go to work. In the middle of the fight, he just gets up and leaves. So I call him, I tell him, look, I'm asking you, I'm asking you a real question, yeah? I told him, I'm going to ask you a real question. He says, well, I said, do you really think you're going to make any deals today when your wife's upset with you at home? He goes to me, probably not. So I told him, what are you doing? What did you leave the house for? Get back up, go back into the house, resolve this, you go back to work. I don't know if you guys, anyone was okay and was privy to see the last week's video. But Rabbi Israeli, Rabbi Taki Israeli, so spoke it. And at the end, he spoke about how, and this is, by the way, I have to say it. It was the first time I looked at something like this in this perspective, the way he said it. It was very nice. Last week, we learned about the mitzvah for the women of Afashat Chala, to separate from the Chala. Right? We know the Sfaradim, 3.5, Ashkenazim, 5 pounds, everyone has their own minhag, yeah? But we separate from the chala. Today we don't have a comment, so we burn it. We discard of it, whatever, in a proper manner. He says, why is it so relevant to us? He says, because it signifies that the woman is the blessing in the home. And the, all the blessing comes from the woman. And he says, there's a Gemara that says, that well, also we see this in the Midrash, in Moshe Rabbeinu, we see the Metan Torah. What happened to Metan Torah? The first time Hashem gave the Torah, thunder, lightning, noise, the whole world was shaking. What ended up happening to those Luchot? They broke. And the one, the second one that came down quietly, nobody heard about it. Those are the ones that we had, that are Kayam and Netzach, that are till not to today. Why? Because the one says, everything that's hidden from the eye has bracha. Everything that's hidden from the eye has blessing. That means if you have a business dealing on the way, don't go and say, hey, by the way, guess what? I got a deal on the pirate. No. Shh. Don't talk. That's why I always see this and I always, it always breaks my heart. People are gotta get engaged or they find the right one and they right away they go, they want to accept it, tell the friends. Everything breaks apart. Why? Because as soon as you're talking about it, the blessing goes. The more you talk, the more the blessing leaves. He says, obviously, something beautiful. He says, if that's the case, then we understand now if the woman is the blessing of the house and we understand that the things that are, are hidden from the eye have the most blessing, the woman is the blessing. He says, now we can understand there's a different element. To why it's so important for women to dress modestly. Why? It's not because if I dress it modestly, it's disrespectful for Tashem. Not only that. He says, more than that, it's because she is the blessing. And the more she covers herself up, the more blessing she brings to the home. The more she exposes, the more blessing goes away. That's what he says. Go, go, go watch it. If not, it wasn't me. And I said to myself, wow, the first time I, I heard this perspective. But it's so true. It's so true. The woman in the mash is the blessing of the house. But it all depends on how you treat your wife. It's like a You know, in Bereshit, when Hashem created Adam and Hava, He says, it's like a What's it's like a The word literally translates to a helper against him. Two contradicting things. And that's a call we call in English an oxymoron. Yeah? It's like a A helper against him. How is it possible? So the Mephashim explain that there's a there's a Gemara Masechet Shabbat the Tosfot over there in regards to last week's parasha well more than last week when Miriam talked about Moshe Rabbeinu more than last week right when Miriam spoke about Moshe Rabbeinu what was her and Aaron's have I mean what did they say Aaron came to her pretty much this is what the Tosfot brings over there in essence he says Aaron came to his sister and told them look if he's not with his wife because why was Miriam upset because Tipora says if Edad Menad if Edad Menad had a prophecy. Woe to their wives, because when my, my husband started getting prophecy, he separated from me. So Miriam said, wait, wait a minute, I also have prophecy, and Aaron also has prophecies. How can it be possible that he separated from his wife? So they, she came to Aaron, and the Sifri mentions who was there, by the way. Don't say Miriam went behind his back. Moshe was in the room. Moshe was sitting over there, she spoke to Aaron, in front of Moshe. 
It's not a classic case of a shonara behind his back. In front of him. She spoke. And what ended up she saying? Oh. So the Gemara, Tosafot says, What was Miriam's have, I mean? Meaning, what does she think? Because at the end of the day, if Hashem didn't agree with Moshe, he would have told him. He speaks to him 24-7. Go back to your wife. This is, by the way, in a way, it's kind of what Aaron was kind of telling Miriam. And what did Miriam answer him? No. But then, Shadam, in the way that a person wants to go, Hashem takes him. So it could be Hashem, Moshe made his own calculation to separate from his wife. And Hashem said, okay, you want to go that way? I agree with you. Not that Hashem told him first. And then we know Hashem spoke up. Moshe didn't have, he had what to answer, he didn't answer. And Torah says he's the most humble person to ever live. We're not going to get to the shul for a different day. We already spoke about it in the past. But from over here, we see the cloud that in the way a person wants to go, Hashem will take him in that way. And it's also true with your wife. How did your wife act with you? Which way is she going to take you? The way you want to go. What you show is important to you, she'll take you that way. If you show that's important to you this way, you'll take it that way. You cannot fake it. You cannot be like, no, no, I really want to go and learn. Yeah, I really want to go and learn. And he's over there with the, with the book in one hand and the phone on the other. Uh-huh. You can't fake it. It's like kids. You can't fake it with kids. The kids, how do they, they know? They see. They're like, they're everything they know. A child knows everything. Everything. You cannot fake it with your kids. I promise you this. You cannot fake it with your kids. Your kids know what's important to their father. They know. And if you show them what's important to you, it'll be important to them. We spoke about it in the past also. I'm not going to get too deep into that. When you show them what's important to you, it'll be, it'll be important to them. But you can't fake it. And you also can't fake it with your wife. So when she sees what's important to you, she'll lead you in that way. But what's important to you is the wrong way, She'll also lead you in that way. Koach, what did he want? Kavod, honor, stature. <coughs> and what did his wife take him to? Honor and stature. On Ben what did he want? He just wanted to do what was right. And what did his wife teach him? Where to take him? To the place that was right. I think now we can understand what is Ezra Kinnik do. That in life, Hashem goes with you the way you want. And we know Koach. How did we call Koach, by the way, we should know, the Sifte Kohen brings down that all the Levim. <coughs> All the Levites that came out of, of Egypt, they all lived in poverty. Why? We know that the Jewish people came out with Berchush Gadol. They came out with a lot of wealth. a lot of every, Who was that? All the people who came out with wealth were the ones who were in slavery for 210 years. As a retribution for their work, Hashem paid them. Were the Levim slaves? No. So they didn't have any money. How did Koch become what the Gemara Sechat Sanhedrin calls him? One of the richest people to ever live. To, until today, they have a saying in Israel. Ashir Ke Koch. Till today. Till today, a wealthy person like Koach. He was one of the wealthiest people to ever live. How did he get over there? How did he get over there? How did he get to the place where he was the most wealthy person in the entire world? So look at this. Found that same principle. But there, Shehotel Alech Molechimoto. The way he wants to go, Hashem takes him. Says that Koach wanted to be very, very wealthy. And Hashem knew that. So what did he do? He helped him find one of the treasures that Yosef hid. You know Yosef is one of the oldest people in the whole entire world. He became the viceroy to, to Paro. After he became the viceroy for Paro, he became one of the, he hid his treasure. Hashem let him find part of that. Just part. You understand how wealthy Yosef was. Just part of it, and that's how he became so wealthy. Good? Now we can understand who Koach was. But what, what was he so upset about? What was he so upset about? You have you come from a very prestigious family. Now we just learned you're one of the wealthiest people in the world to ever live. You have a wife who's a, a wicked person. <laughs> Maybe his wife is the only reason he's upset. Yeah? What are you upset about? So listen to this. So really he brings down the Defertion and the Midrash be Midbar Rabbah. That Koach reasoned to himself, I'm destined for greatness. I'm going to be great. How did you know he's going to be great? First thing first, he brings down that his father's name was Yisachar. Yitzchak, which was also translated loosely to oil. So oil, for those who don't know, when a king comes into power, when a Kohen becomes a new Kohen, they inaugurate him with oil. Right? They give him oil. He says, look, I'm supposed to be righteous. I'm supposed to be powerful. And more than that, says the Midrash, that he saw through Ruach HaKodesh, through divine intervention, that he's going to have a greatness come from him. Who? Shemuel Anavi and other 17 different groups of people at Ruach HaKodesh. He saw that his descendants are going to be great people. She said, I'm destined to be great. So therefore, I don't understand. How come they're not treating me like I'm great? 
you know that if we look at the family tree, we have Kehat, Amram, Yitzhakar, Hebron, and Uziel. Right? So this is the, the family tree of the Kehat family. Amram was Moshe's father and Aaron's father. Good? So you have Aaron, Moshe. Well, Aaron, Miram, Moshe. Then you have Yitzhakar, and his firstborn was Korach. And then you have the fourth, you have Hebron, the fourth brother, Amram. His second son was Alitzafan. His second son was Alitzafan. Now, there was a position up for grabs to be the leader of the family of Kehat. To be the leader of the family of Kehat. And who did he go to? So Koach reasoned in his mind. Let's think logically for a second. Good? So let's go on, let's go on in, in lineage. Yeah, let's go to lineage. So we have Aaron, Moshe. Okay, fluke over there. Aaron was supposed to be first. And then Moshe. But Moshe became on top of him. Okay, it's a fluke. Good, maybe there's a fluke over there that Aaron came before Moshe. But let's ignore that for a moment. Who's the next in line? Aaron, Moshe, Korach. I'm supposed to be the next in line. Okay. So who's supposed to be the leader of the, 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 the family of the, of the Kehat? Me. So give it to me. Okay, you want to skip me? Give it to my younger brother. You want to skip him? Give it to my, younger, my second younger brother. You want to skip me? Hebron didn't have children. Okay. Go to the fourth one. Give it to his oldest son. No. He gave it to his second oldest son. So what's going on over here? Everything is Salat Matbukha. Everything is all mixed up. He says, if it's supposed to be true lineage, then I'm supposed to be next in line. And what's the mistake he made? This I find very funny. One time I, uh, also I was a Chebuch Hashem to do a few Shuduchim in my life to set up a few guys and girls. So there was one time a guy sent me his resume and I had a girl and everything matched. Hashem, you see the resume is everything fit. She was 5'3", he was 5'4", Mamash, everything was perfect, yeah? Good, it was like, yeah, it was like a match made in heaven, two Lego pieces fit together. Good. So I have someone reach out to her, and I say, call her, and tell her that I had the perfect guy for her. She, she sees the resume, she agrees, but she says, wait a minute, in my house, we have the minhag. What's the minhag? That my older sister, the younger sister doesn't get married before the older sister. So I told her, you know where that minhag came from? Hmm? Lavan. Why? Because when Yaakov wanted to marry Rachel, he got Leah instead. What did Lavan answer him? Why did I give you my oldest daughter? Because over here in our place, we have the Minak that we don't marry the youngest before the oldest. So where does Minak come from? So it has nothing to do with lineage. Okay, let's go to the time of history. Avraham Avinu. Okay, the first, the most amazing Jew in the whole entire world. We'll talk about him maybe a little bit later. Good? He had two sons. Ishmael was older. And also, Yitzchak. Good. Who was greater? Yitzchak. Who was greater? Yitzchak. Yitzchak. Oh, wait a minute. Who's younger? Yitzchak. Oh, let's keep on going then. Maybe it's a, a hey, mistake. Let's make a mistake maybe. Now the next one. Let's go to Yaakov and Esav. Who's older? Esav's Who's greater? Yaakov. Oh, so we're finding a pattern now? Let's keep on going. Maybe another fluke. Okay, let's go to Yaakov's children. Okay, who, who, who's the oldest? Yeah. Uven. Who's the greatest? Yosef. Yosef. Or Yuda. Good. Neither of them are the firstborn. Good. Let's go to Moshe and Aaron now. Who's older? Uh, Aaron. Aaron. Who's greater? Moshe. Oh, wait a minute. What's going on here? There's a pattern, you're right. Oh, we skipped one, by the way. If I am in a shit. Oh, you forgot about that one. But it's okay, we'll let that one go. <laughs> what happened here? Maybe you can tell me. So you see the Torah doesn't follow lineage. But Koak said to himself in his head, Oh, I'm going to make a whole combina over here. I'm going to make a whole... I'm going to trick people to follow me. Why? Because there's some little bit of sliver of sense that maybe I can cling on to and I'm going to use this to manipulate people. Koch was, and, 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 and it's unfortunate to say because Koch was, had the potential to be so great. And he was great. But this is what that is done for. That he wanted the kavod, he wanted the honor. Wait a minute, what about me? What? It's not enough that you're the richest person in the whole entire world. Yeah? It's not enough that you have, you're one of the most prestigious families. In the no. God forbid they skip you and give. The, you think anyone in the world really wants, I'm, I'm being honest now. If I offered anyone over here the job to be the president of the United States, I think everybody over here would run away. Okay? Why? It only comes with responsibilities. What do you want? By the way, I don't want responsibilities. You know, <laughs> there's many rabbis will tell you, I'd rather not be the rabbi of the Kila, I promise you. I have no choice. What can I do? But I'd rather not be. Why? It's so many responsibilities. You know, on Tuesdays, what do you do on Tuesday? You go, you do what you gotta do, you guys go, whatever. Good? Tuesday, I go to Kolel, I come home from the minute I get home, I'm in the book, and then I have seven books in front of me. My wife said, come on, help me with the kids. I said, I can't. I have to prepare this you. Okay, good. One day of the week. What about Thursday? And Wednesday, the office. 
You guys get to go enjoy. Winter time, okay. You don't, you don't feel it. It's cold outside. It's summertime. Kids want to go to the park. Kids want... So what, what, what are you missing out on, Korach? More responsibilities? You want more responsibilities? No problem. We'll give you a few of them. Like in, uh, laundry? Chavod. Get the folding. Trust me, my wife will be happy. Give me some other for the laundry, yeah? It's usually me. <laughs> so what happened? You're looking for responsibilities? But when a person is chasing after Kavod, when you're chasing after the honor, there is no logic. There is no sense. That's what makes sense to me. Yes, I'm going to do whatever I want. I'm going to do whatever I... F- <laughs> and this is why he fell. And listen to this. Tiferet Zion says, and I think this is actually one of the biggest things I can talk about tonight. The commentary on the Midrash, Tiferet Zion, he asks a question. What's the question that he asks? He says, how is it possible that Korach Wait a minute for the tzaddik to leave. Who's older? <laughs> Fair. Yeah, you the oldest. Okay, the oldest. Well, the same. You also be the greatest. Folks. <laughs> Tiferet Yon says, like I bet Korach. We said that Korach had Gorcha Kodesh, right? He had divinely intervention. But we just learned how he was lacking the attributes to be a person who has divinely godly prophecy. How is it possible? A person who's lacking certain attributes has prophecy. Said the Tiferet Yon, a beautiful answer. He says, you know why? What's the answer? He says, it wasn't that he was worthy of it. It was that because of his surroundings, he became worthy of it. Because his surroundings were a place that were fit for prophecy, that's why he got prophecy. Meaning to say, because he was from the family of Kehat, that's why Shem. Give me prophecy. Let's understand who, who the Kehat family was first. Good? If you go back to Bamidbar, it says, Hashem commands Moshe. Right? And he says to them that the, the Kehati family, the Ha Kehati family, right? Shevet Hamishpachot Ha Kehati. That's what it says over there. And then it says they should never be separated from the Levine. That's what it says. They should never be cut off from the Levine. Comes the Rabbeinu Bachi and asks a question. He says, wait a minute. How come the Torah changed its Lashon all of a sudden? It didn't say Mishpachot Kehat. It says Mishpachot Ha Kehati. Why did it add these two extra letters? Hey and you. Says Rabbi Nubachet that he saw, Hashem saw to divine intervention, Hashem obviously in his infinite wisdom, that Korach was going to come up against Moshe, and a few people from the family of Kehat were also going to join with him. And because of that, he already saved him over here. Why? He took half of his name. How do we spell Hashem's name? Yud, K, Vav, K. Took half of it, Yud and K, put it into their names to save him from the embarrassment that was going to come over there. So understand, who, who did Hashem do this for? A person that's valuable to him. So you're right. But Kehat is so valuable to me, I'm going to save him this one time. So look how valuable Kehat was. And that's why he was Zohet HaGol Kodesh. And now from over here we can understand how important it is the company a person keeps. For both ways. The company you keep is so important. The people you hang out with. Your friends. The people you hang out with is so important to who you are as an individual. So important to you as an individual. Listen to this. The Rambam, he writes in Mishnah Torah and Teshuvah, in the fourth chapter, he says there's 24 things that hold a person back from doing Teshuvah, from doing repentance. He says, among them, there are five, that anyone who indulges in them, it's almost impossible to get away from these things because they're so, I don't know, a, I don't know how to say vicious, they were addicting. And they're very difficult to dif- separate from them. And the person has to be very careful to run away from them because they're the most obnoxious character traits a person can have. And they're so easy to fall into, that you have to actively run away from it. What are they? Says the Rambam, gossip, echilut, lashon ara, wrath, anger, good, evil thoughts, and the fifth one, attaching yourself to bad company, being with bad people, hanging out with the wrong crowd, the wrong people. Says these things are so dangerous for a person that a person has to do everything he possibly can to run away from them, to run away from them. <coughs> they stop him from becoming a better person. This is the Rambam likes. Listen to this. The Gemara Masechet Avdo Zerah says, there's a Pasuk in Tehilim. The first Pasuk in Tehilim, Chavod, Ashrei Aish, Asher Lo Alach Batal Rechayim, Derech Atayim, Lo Amad, Umoshav Letzim, Lo Yashav. Yafeh Mahod. There's a Pasuk in Tehilim. The first, first in Tehilim. Happy is the person that didn't what? Happy is the person that did not walk in the counsel of the wicked. He didn't stand in the way of the sinners, nor did he sit in the company of the scoffers. That's what his friends like to do. Good? 
Says the Gemara Sechet Avodah Zarah. What's going on over here? Why do we need this whole breakdown? Happy, sad, this, that. He says, if a person didn't walk, there's no way he stood. Meaning, if I didn't walk with them, how did I get to the place where I stood with them? And if I didn't stand with them, how did I get to the place where I stood with where I sat with them? And if I didn't stay, sit with them, then how did I get to the place that I was like them? It says over here, therefore learn from David Amelech. How do you get to the place where you become a scoffer? It starts by going with them. And when you go with them, oh, that'll lead you to stand with them. Oh, now you stand with them, you end up sitting with them. You end up sitting with them, you end up becoming one of them. It says, when you hang out with people, even just hang out, ah, you know what, I'll just go. And it says, the Gemara continues, it doesn't, it doesn't finish over there. It says, you know, someone comes to himself, you know what, I won't go in their ways. I'll just sit down and do nothing, I'll stand idle. It says, it's not enough. It's not enough. How do you know? In the second verse, second verse of Tehillim, what does he say? What does David David say in the second verse of Tehillim? Ubetorato yehege yom And in, in Hashem's ways, I will toil in the morning and night. In the Torah. Why? Because it's not enough to just say, I'm not going to go hang out with them. You have to actively run away from it. You have to actively run away from these people. You have to actually run away from them. Not to hang out with them. Don't be a part of them. Don't go to their places. Don't go anywhere next to them. Actively go the other way. They're going right, you go left. Where do we see this from? Avraham Avinu, when he noticed that Lot, his grandson, not grandson, his uh, nephew. When his nephew was a wicked person, after he said that he wanted to go to Stone Valley, what did he say? Huh? He says, you go right, I go left. You go left, I go right. Why? Now that I established that you're a wicked person, Whichever way you're going, won't the opposite. I don't care which way I have to go. You want to go right, I'll go left. You want to go left, I'll go right. Why? Because wherever you're going, I'm purposely going the opposite way. Stay away from you. Why? Because you can bring me down. You can cause me to fall. And listen to this. Now we can maybe understand how Korah got 250 great people to fall. We'll see later on what he did to get them in. And why it falls so beautifully into this category. But now we can understand how they got them to fall. When you hang out with bad company, it ends up becoming who you are. You know the famous saying? You hang out with a smoker, even if you don't smoke, what are you going to smell like? A smoker. That's what it is. The people you hang around with, it makes a difference. And we see this from Korach. And listen to what the Ramchal writes. We spoke about Mesad and Sharim. Listen to what the Ramchal writes. The Ramchal writes, in the fifth chapter, there are three factors that cause a person to lose his carefulness. What does it mean, carefulness? In life, you have to be zariz. You have to be careful. You have to be zehirut. You have to be a person who's careful. Watch out for yourself. Watch out for your body. Don't go to the wrong places. Don't eat the wrong things, right? So there's three things that cause a person to lose them. What are those three things? Toiling too much in worldly affairs. Working, this, that, whatever. It's too much. It's not good. Because it takes you, it makes you so... Right? There's a Mishnah Pakeh Avot, Marben Hasim. A person who increases in his business endeavors, he increases his worries. So the more businesses you have, the more worries you have. The more worries you have, the less focus you can be on yourself. Very simple. Second one, he says, laughing, laughter, and scoffing. What does it mean, laughter and scoffing? Not like when we make jokes and we're laughing over here. No. A person who makes it a joke, it's called a litzan, a litz. A person who makes a joke, and something serious. You come and talk to him and say, listen, you have to change your life. <laughs> Just the other week, I was sitting down with a person. He came, a guy looks like who knows what. It's a Hazid case. They brought him to me. I'm like, I'm trying to talk to him. And everything I say makes another joke. I told him, I know exactly what you're doing. You think that you're going to make your jokes. You're going to run away from the reality of it. You don't want to be confronted with the realism. You don't want to face the pain. No problem. Keep on making your jokes. You're never going to get anyone in your life. Don't show this face. You think you changed him? No. Because he's a Alex, a person who's a scoffer, He's never going to change. Why? Because you can never take, he never take, he never can take anything seriously. You tell him you shouldn't do the drugs. And he keeps on with his, uh, why? And he's never going to change. Because he can never take the rebuke. He can never take it. Because every time he tells something, he's going to come like uh, another excuse. Or why he's okay. Or why another joke. Second thing. And the third thing he says, start to show him, bad company. Why bad company? He says, a person can get to a place where he worked on himself. And he got himself to a place where he is zahir, careful and watchful and alert. But his friends can ruin him. What do I mean? He says he'll compromise on his values not to look weird in his friends' eyes. How many times do we see 
The girl says, you know what? I want to keep myself dressing a little bit more modesty. Yeah? And she starts doing it and her friend's like, oh, look who it is, the Rabbanit. Yeah? Or the woman who wants to start wearing a head covering. She goes to work the first time and she gets the look, she gets the day, she gets... Why? Because that's how people treat the world. What happens to her? She gets discouraged and she stops. No, I don't want to be looked at like an oddball. I don't want to be looked at like the weird one. Or the guy starts wearing kippah. Yeah? So he starts wearing kippah. He says, oh, I'm not wearing kippah. And everyone's going to judge me. I'm going to go to work. You're going to look at me. Yeah? I guarantee you, first of all, I'm telling you, nobody cares. Yeah? Let's put, let's put it on the table. Nobody really cares if you wear kippah or not. And nobody really cares if you dress modestly or not. Wait two minutes. Let the stupid jokes pass. And keep on going. But because we let it affect us, it stops us from being in the right places. But why? Because we're around them. If you weren't around them, you would never be here. You'd never be there to be embarrassed by them. But imagine now you were hanging out with good people. People who are religious, whatever it is. What would they tell you? Wow. What a shit I can give you praise. What would that make you want to do? Continue to grow. Continue to get better. Also, you see, it does make a difference. I don't care how much you work on yourself. If you go out there and you're hanging out with people who are not like you, they will bring you down. You can be the strongest person in the whole entire world. They'll bring you down. And this is what we see from Korah. Could be that Korah himself didn't get brought down. Maybe from his wife. But the 250 people, they all got brought down from him. He brought all of them down. Why? Because he says, come hang out with me. What do we come hang out with me? How did Korah get them? Huh? Anybody else I got them? Let me not your legs. He threw a big banquet. So let's go. You know, today you want to do fundraiser. What do they do? They do a gigantic dinner. Good? They invite everybody over there. I set up tables for Malachim. Set over there food, steak, pagiyot, whatever you want. Oh, everything on the table. Hummus, salatim. I call Shama. Everything's there. They bring you a singer from the stars. Yeah. Good. And they put you a video on the screen with some sad drop music in the back. Yeah. And then that. Yeah. <laughs> At the end of the event. Oh, we're collecting for this cause. And everyone already over there. Pagala and Balev. They already feel it now. The music hit. <laughs> the music hit them in the heart. So right away, the guy's like, no, no, take my wallet. Take my wallet. How much you need? Ten? Yalakah. They know how to butter you up. First, they come to feed you. Your stomach is full. Good. Oh, okay, I'm good. No, no, I'm not anxious. I'm not trying to go anywhere. Now I have good entertainment. The guys, <laughs> guys sitting over there singing. Everything's good to go. And then, so, excuse me, ladies and gentlemen, we're going to take a brief moment to watch this video compilation that we put together for our organization. Please, everybody, rest for a moment of silence as we watch this video. And then they put the video on the screen. And then they put you the most sad music in the background. The violin, just the violin and no pictures in the background, you're already crying. <laughs> no pictures, violin. <laughs> and I said, then they were donated. Yeah? What do they do? Right away, you get it. Because they got you to the lay. Koach is a smart person. He said, what are we going to do? I'm going to make them a banquet. I open them, Shulchan Shemalachi. Open them a table over there, big party, send out flyers everywhere. Yeah, we're throwing a party. Everybody come, everybody's invited. And everybody came. Now, what happened? What happened? He comes over there. The Akut Shemoni brings down a parable. As soon as, and he purposely didn't, you know, the, that, in those times, the Kohen had to get his portion of the meat. When he saw an animal, he had to give to the Kohen the portion of the meat. He purposely didn't give the Kohen a portion of the meat. Why didn't he give the Kohen the portion of the meat? He wanted them to come to the party to collect it. So now comes al Azar, the son of the Kohen, the Kohen's children, they come to collect. And now Kohen says, oh, look who it is. The Kohen, the Kohen came, came to pick up his food. Let me tell everybody a story. There was a, a widow, her husband passed away. In it comes the side of music, and he had someone in the back with the violin. A widow with two daughters, her husband passed away. She had a small sediment of land. She said to herself, okay, I need to make money, so I'll plow the land. Before she plows the towel, you need the pe'ah, the leket, you have all these things you have to leave behind. Then she takes it up, okay, now you have maser rishon, maser sheni, then you have, <laughs> you have all these things you have to separate from the food you take. She goes, ah, it's not profitable for me to work the land. I have to give from here, I have to give from here, I have to give from here. Okay, I'll sell my land, I'll buy two sheep. She sells the land, she buys two sheep. She shaves, she wool, she takes off the, she does the sharing of the wool. Comes the coin and says, oh, the first of the wool belongs to me. Okay, there's no money here either. What I'll do is I'll slaughter my goats. I go, that's it. I'll make some meat out of them. As soon as he slaughters them, he says, well, now I need my pieces from the meat. Because you guys are impossible. You guys are terrible. I can't get away from you guys. You know what? I'd rather just donate it than have any. I'm going to donate it to the Mikdash. I'm going to donate it to the Holy Temple. Great. Now it all belongs to me. <laughs> he leaves. Now everybody hears the story. And the is sitting over there. 
And Korach just painted an ex, a beautiful image in the Rhine, how everything was done in the most corrupt way. That Moshe and Aaron, they came over here with their own benefits. They wanted to make everything for themselves. Now, one underlying theme that Korach forgot. What was the underlying theme? That Judaism, and you'll find this to be true everywhere, everywhere in the world. But Judaism is one of the only religions that requires somebody to give something from themselves. What do I mean? When you have crops, you have your crop, you have to give myself. You have to give myself Yishor, myself Shani, you have to give to Umar, you have to. And some say over to the money, you also have to give for the money. I mean, I mean the money is more of a minhag, she became. No, Kesef, Kesef. Money, today, money. Today, money. Today it became a money. Today you don't have to give 10%, but it's the right thing to do. You must say, it's Aftichal Shushirut, Rashi, so on and so forth. Good? But you see, the Torah is the only place that requires a person has to give. And what's a person to tell himself? If I give, I'm losing for myself. And the Torah says it's completely the opposite. The more you give, the more you get. In life, you want to get, you have to give. So Hashem says, go to the land now, you have Shemitah year. On the seventh year, you have to leave. the land has to rest. Hashem says, on the Shemitah year, I spoke about this in the past, I'm not just going to not give you. you. Leave the land. Let, let everybody come. Give it for the Aniyin. Let them come take whatever they want. You take whatever you want. On the sixth year, I'm going to give you enough. Three years worth. Three years worth. You give me one, I give you three. What kind of deal is this? What kind of deal is this? And Koach played on the... Let me hold on to this little bit of logic over here to twist the people. And he got 250 people to come after him. Why? All because they went to his party. If they never would have went to his party, they never would have fell. They never would have had the music and the, and the, man, and the violin. They never would have fell. But because they went to hang out with him, they went to the Bible, they ended up falling. Because of that. Listen to this. The message of Sharim doesn't finish it over here. Says the another Sharim. He says, so what can a person do? He finds himself now. I didn't want to hang out with them, but I'm here now. I got stuck with these people now. What do I do? He says, if they mock you, don't take it to your heart. Rather, it's exactly the opposite. When they mock you, you should be mocking them. So you're laughing at me. I should be laughing at you. Remember, I'm never going to forget the story. I think I said it over here one time before. Rabbi Wallstein. Rabbi Zechariah Wallstein. That's all. Whenever before he passed away, give us your. Now, for those who don't know, on Avenue L over here. You know, Avenue L, which way is it? This way? That way? That, this way. Yeah? I think so, no? That way? So, Avenue L over here. Okay, okay, okay. That's Coney. That's this way. That way. He got it right. That's way. Okay? Avenue L over here, they have a, they have a shul called Landau. Lenda, they have a factory of, of Minyani. Every 10 million, another 3,000, maybe 100 million Jews. <laughs> Every day over there, yeah? And I was, one time went to pray a week over there. It happened to be that he was praying, and it happened to be there's a Holocaust survivor sitting next to him. And there was a, a younger guy, as they were praying, non stop talking on the phone. So the Holocaust survivor got upset with him. And the guy says, shh. The Holocaust survivor. So he, I don't know what he, what he said, Bijuk, but he answered him in a very respectful way. So Rabbi Wallstein got upset. He says to him, Hello, hey, why are you talking like this? Tfila. And the guy gets up and says, Oh, look who's talking. The great Rabbi Wallstein who gives shirim for, for women, this, that. In public, try to give him an uh, embarrassment. Now, Rabbi Wallstein said to himself, At that moment, he got angry, and his first instinct was, Rabbi Wallstein used to play hockey when he was younger. So my first instinct was, I'm going to punch this guy in the face. And I can relate to that feeling. <laughs> yeah? I'm going to punch this guy in the face. He says, but you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to hold myself back. The kid leaves. The Holocaust survivor goes to him after he's upset. Uh, Wallace tells the guy, he says to him, you know what? He says, let's not be upset with him. Let's pray for him. We can choose to be angry with him right now. Or we can choose to say, this is a person who's crying out for help. And really, he needs help. And instead of seeing him and saying, Oh, why is he coming after me and getting upset about myself? What are you going to say? I know where I'm at. I know my word. I know my value. If you're the one lashing out, if you're the one going on and on, the problem is by you. Anyone who comes to tell you that you're not good, he himself is not good. It's a process. Anyone who comes to tell you that you're not good, he himself is not good. Because a person can only see something that he has in himself. 
And therefore, when they come to mock you, don't get upset with them. Don't say, oh, uh, and they get discouraged. Rather, you should see them and say, you know what, I'm going to pray for you. Because you're really the one who needs them. Not me. I'm Hashem in a good place. And he takes it a step further, says the Ramchad. He says, if a person would find himself in a situation where he had a business dealing where he can make hundreds of millions of dollars, would he concern himself with another person trying to mock him? What do I care? I'm going to make hundred million dollars. Do whatever you want. Cry from today to tomorrow. Tell me I'm like this. I'm a ten bill. I'm not... I'll take out this trash right now for hundred million dollars tomorrow. No problem. And I don't care. He says, how much more so for your soul? When it comes to things that are good for you, those things you're willing to give up because another person back to you. But if it was a hundred million dollar deal, you wouldn't give it up. And what's more important, the money or your neshama? Obviously your neshama. I can go on for hours on why it's more important if you want, but uh, I'll save you guys a time. She said, how come when it comes to the money, we don't care, mock me, make fun of me, I know I'm making my money. But when it comes to our own growth, and our own spiritual growth, and our own things that we're trying to do for ourselves, then we care. She said, you know what the truth is? Don't care. You know how we know? There's a Mishnah, Pakeh Avot says, have a azkanamir. You should be brazen like a leopard, la asot, ratzon avicha sheba shamay. To do the will of your father. You should be brazen. Why not be brazen? You shouldn't care about nobody. Hashem says, I'm doing, I'm doing. I don't care. Say this, that. It doesn't affect me. And now we have the answer. When it comes to things that you do for God, you have to be brazen like a leopard. To be strong, steadfast. I don't care. Say whatever you want to say. And if you're going to say something against me, then you're the one who's going to lose. Chamavadia, for those who don't know who Chamavadia is, Chamavadia is the, this far, without the, who would be here today? Someone, we wouldn't be here today, Chamavadia. Good? Chamavadia, when he first came out, in regards to Koch also, there's something called the, the Chazal bring down, there's two types of Machlokit. The one time I asked the Rabbi Shineman, how, how is it possible that the Koch and his, and they fell? So he says, when it comes to people who are very strong, religiously, you cannot break them, the Yetzirah only has one way to get them, Machlokit. The debate, arguments, that's the only way you can get them. The Mishnah says that there's two types of machloket. Machloket Hashem Shamaim, Kebet Shamaim, Bebet Hilel, like the two great sages who would argue back and forth endlessly, but only to figure out the truth. And, Machloket Hashem Shamaim, and the debate is not for the sake of God, which is Koch Ve'edato. Not Koch and Moshe. Not Koch arguing with Moshe. Koch and his own congregation, because Moshe wasn't even arguing with them. Moshe was like, what do you guys want from me? <laughs> I don't do anything. I don't do whatever you want. Fight whatever you want. And look at this. The Midrash says that Moshe was so humble. He said, maybe they're right. Maybe, maybe I am wrong. So he told him, go now. We'll do. We'll all bring our offerings. <coughs> and what happened to Koach and his thing? The floor opened up and swallowed them. Not only them, them and their money. All the money they had, all the possessions, also got swallowed up in the ground. But we see, it's not called Mokhlok Hashem Shamayim. Having a debate for the sake of God. We see when Hamavadiah first came out, there was one straight self of Allah, one for the Sephardim, which is called the Ben Yishchai. Hamavadiah, when he first came out, he had a sefer of, of, of laws that were against the laws of the Ben Yishchai. And many people in the beginning burnt his Sephardim. They came and they burnt it, and they wrote Shavuot against him. And Ham came, and I remember hearing this in the, one of the Shurim, he says, he came to his father, and he said to him, Ava, it's koev, it hurts. You see Gdolim, you see greats in Am Yisrael, they're burning your Sfarim. And Chamavadah told him, when I leave this world, there will not be one shul in all of the world that doesn't have my Sfarim inside. And by the way, it's true. You're never going to find one Bed Midrash that doesn't have a Chazan Ovadia, Yabia Omer, whatever, it doesn't make a difference. Your kuchos, doesn't matter. You're always going to find, even Ashkazim, you'll always find one. Why? Because when you have a Makhluk al Hashem Shamayim, but we see, what was his options? Listen to everybody who's pushing up against me and do nothing with my life. And I'll leave it alone. Okay? You know people don't like it? Okay, I'm running away. And then stop. And then we wouldn't be here today. But because he pushed through, because he persevered, what ended up happening? We're all here today. So in life, if you know you're doing the right thing, who cares what other people are saying? What do you have to care about then? There was one guy, it's a real story by the way. His uh, name, I wrote it down, but... Uh, Artem, his name is Artem, Russian guy, good, he went to a very prestigious, so on, one of the good high schools over here in, uh, in Brooklyn or New York, and when he graduated, he wasn't sure, most people who graduate high school, they're not sure what they want to do, right, he wasn't sure what he's going to do, so he didn't really apply to too many colleges, he applied to one or two that were, you know, no one's getting into, yeah, and the rest, he left, so obviously he didn't get into the two that he wanted to. And by the time he realized and woke up, 
the registration was very close for everything else. He said, okay, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to take the first job that comes my way. He went to the Pfeiffer job. What was the first job he got? Working at a Verizon retail store selling phones. Welcome to Verizon. Welcome to Verizon. I see a phone sir. What do you need to do today? Oh, it's not working? Okay, no problem. What is that? Is uh, Samsung? Let's change it over to a Galaxy S5. Come on, quickly. Yeah? Come on, my friend. Don't worry about it. This is an upgrade package for free. $200 a week today. You're good to go with a new phone. Brand new with the new kit. Free screen protector. Khabib, I just sold your phone. You ready? Ready to go? No? You ready to come to the counter, right? That's it. <laughs> so, he says I'm going to sell phones. Now, you would think how long he would do it for? A semester. And then afterwards, you reapply. No. It's so a past semester. He still doesn't apply. Now, at this point, all of his friends saying, look, in the beginning, we understand. He didn't have a choice. But now, come on. You can imagine what his parents are telling him. Come on. Go back to school. Get serious. I says, no, look. I'm, I know I like this job. I'm okay over here. I'm going to get to know it. It'll work out. He continues to work over there. He gets to know the ins and outs. A few years later, they make him the manager. Wow. Like a bogus show up manager. Yeah? Short time after, the owner says, look, I don't want this store anymore. He comes to this guy and tells him, I want to sell it to you. So I don't have the cash to buy it. I only have a little bit. So I'll, I'll let you give me whatever you have. And the rest I'll give you on credit. You pay me back over time. Okay, no problem. He takes the store. And within three years, the guy had 12 stores in Manhattan. He was a multimillionaire. Multimillionaire. Till today, you can go search him up online. Why am I telling the story? Not because I care about this guy. I'll tell you the story. Because you see there's a person when, oh, no, what are you doing? Run away, run away. If you're going to try to please everybody in the world, you're never going to be successful. Because everybody's going to have someone else to pull you. Oh, come here, come here, come here, come here. You need to figure out what's right for you. You need to figure out what the right thing is to do. How do you get there? By doing introspection. By being real with yourself. Okay, what's the right thing to do? Let me think about my actions. Okay, what's going to be the outcome of this action now? Okay. Okay, it's the right thing to do. This is what Hashem wants for me. Okay, no problem. I'm doing it. I don't care. I don't see nothing else. This is what I see. I'm going straight. You cannot break me. You're never going to move me. That's it. I'm not moving. Why? I know what doing is right. And no one will ever move, you'll be successful. You'll be successful. The reason why Koch was able to drop 250 people is because they want to hang out with him. Don't hang out with people who are not in the same place as you. You know how many Jewish people we saw who come to the Shireen, they get strong, they want to grow, and then they go and they hang out with old friends or this, that. Or how many people we see that moved away somewhere else, came back and lost himself. I know personally a story of a guy who uh, went down to Florida. He was extremely strong over here. Went down to Florida. His friends from the past called him, called him, called him, called him. No, 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 no. I don't want to hang out. I don't want to hang out. Eventually, they called him one night to go hang out. Lost himself completely. One time. One time. Because the company you keep is very important. That's Tam Chazal coming and telling us now. It's very, very important. It's the Mishnah in the Ga'im that says, Oy lo, shreno. Woe to him and woe to his neighbor. Woe to him and woe to his neighbor. Because the punishment doesn't stop there. It will pass on to you. Why? Because. What does David Amalek say? First you walk, then you stand, then you sit, then you become. It starts slowly. It's not uh, right away. It's a slow, slow process. You have to actively run away from it. You have to actively run the other way. And when you do that... Then you can be the best person you, you're destined to be. Then you can be the right person. And stop caring what other people have to say. Hamchal says, they laugh at you, laugh at them. And only then you can be zokhe to be the best person you possibly can be. We all be zokhe to go the right ways of Hashem, go straight like arrows, and everything we do. Amen. 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 Good.